fantastic we are live <laughs> so uh welcome everyone and so uh i um i'm here to welcome you to the limitless careers week and this afternoon's panel is on robotics and artificial intelligence so we're celebrating National Careers Week in the UK, and these sessions are organised by the Institute of Physics. And they're a fantastic opportunity to find out more about the types of career that uh, doing physics can open up. So I am Dr. Clara Barker. I am a material scientist at Oxford University uh, and the I think my something's just gone off. I'm back. <laughs> we always have technical issues. So yeah, I'm Dr. Claire Becker, and I'm joined by four fantastic speakers from all over the world of science. Their jobs look at robotics and AI in all sorts of different ways, but they have one thing in common. Doing physics helped them to get there. We'll hear from each of these speakers, have a chat about their exciting careers, and then it's over to you for your questions. Please send the questions over the web webinar chat function, and we'll do our best to answer them. So I'm just going to briefly introduce today's speakers, and then I'll allow them to introduce themselves. So first, we have Dr. Luke Davis. So Luke is uh, a passionate about the knowledge of physics uh, and how uh, the knowledge of physics can explain nature. He grew up in Warwickshire and Oxfordshire before attending Swansea University and completing a PhD at University College in London. Luke currently works in the University of Luxembourg using mathematics, physics, and computers to understand the science behind controlling organisms, both living and the robotics of the future, tiny nanoscale devices. Matthew Gondry, Matthew Gondry is a robotics and remote handling engineer working for Jacobs, an engineering company. He studied physics at university and now specializes in designing, building and controlling remote inspection and intervention equipment. Robots are usually uh, mainly used in the nuclear industry to conduct work which is hard to reach or in dangerous environments. Matthew Watkins uh, Matthew is an engineering technician at Imperial College London, working in the physics department. A former apprentice, he assists researchers with the designing and manufacture of bespoke parts for projects at the cutting edge of technology, ranging from prosthetic legs for ballet dancers to prototype iron thrusters. Outside of the workshop, Matthew loves nothing more than baking and playing volleyball and cricket. And fourth, we have uh, Raquel Velesco. So Raquel is the head, up, head of product at uh, Vivacity Labs, which is an AI startup in the transportation sector that helps cities and councils to manage the movement of people and traffic. It is important to Raquel that what she does has a positive impact both on individuals and society as part of her role. She's helped develop an AI-based system to improve traffic lights. Raquel has a master's in physics from the University of Oxford and an MBA from London Business School, but she originally chose to study physics because she wanted to be an astronaut. In her spare time, Raquel loves, nothing, uh, loves to be in the water as much as possible, particularly uh, swimming and sailing. So shortly, we'll hand over to uh, speaker one, which is Luke, to start our session. Uh, please do remember to send in questions and don't forget to include the speaker's name if you've got a specific question for that person. And with that, uh, over to Luke. Thank you, Clara. So hello, everyone. Um, so as Clara says, I'm a physicist. So I'm a doctor, but not the one you come to for, for medical problems. But uh, come to me if you have any physics problems. Um, so can we go to the next slide, please? So I love physics. Um, everyone who knows me knows this. Um, and I think, you know, one should be, should be proud of what, what they do. Um, and I seem to love physics so much that uh, what I do, um, other people 
um, I think is actually not wrong. <laughs> um, so that's okay. So so I was at Swansea um, University um, starting my, my physics journey. And then I went to University College London. So if you, can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. So here's um, just kind of a, a group of us starting the, we were the first um, students as part of this kind of physics of, of biology. So they just asked us to take a, <laughs> a, a picture in front of the, the stairs and we sort of looked like an awkward band, um, <laughs> but there you go. Um, can we, can we do the next slide? Yeah. So I started to, to wonder about biology. So on the left, you, there's this cat, let's just call him Tom. And the funny thing is, is that Tom is actually made up of uh, millions and billions of, of these tiny um, balls called cells. They're kind of just gooey things. And inside the cell is another gooey sac um, containing things like DNA. And I spent a lot of time looking at how um, things go through through this, this purple sac. And actually, I had to basically work on, for four years, looking at hairy tubes. So um, that's how I got into bio, biology. Um, can you go into the next slide, please? <laughs> so what do I spend my time doing? Um, I use a lot of math, um, computers, so like writing code, um, telling computers what to do in order to learn something new about the world. And I spend a lot of time thinking about physics. So these are kind of my, my three tools I use as a, as a physicist. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> um, so what I look at now is something called, well, it's, it's biology. So if you were to look out the window or to walk in a park, walking your dog or something, sometimes you see a kind of a group of birds and they, they sort of follow each other. And it looks kind of weird, right? But it's also pretty amazing. Um, this is called flocking. Um, and it happens in fish as well. So in the next slide, I'll show you. So sometimes if you, if you watch like a nature documentary, you will see these, um, they're called schools of fish. Um, they don't actually go to school. They're just swimming together um, in a group. Um, and all of these, these kind of grouping behaviors can be understood using physics, bizarrely enough. So um, can we go to the next slide? <laughs> um, so yeah, so we have, so Alex is just a bird. Um, we have Zoe, a fish. And um, if you look at them individually, you can kind of pretend they're an arrow. So Alex, when he flies, he flies in a direction. So Alex is flying in a direction. And also when Zoe swims, she's swimming in a, in a direction too. And as a physicist, we like to simplify things a lot, almost very weirdly. So I'm just gonna picture them as just arrows. Um, so then a group of them looks like next, the next slide. <laughs> just, so when I see these things, when I walk in the park, I literally just see lots of arrows. Um, and this is very simplistic, but actually it's quite powerful because if we can use simple models to understand how biology works, we might be able to make machines and robots ourselves. Um, so if we go to the next slide, so just on the left is kind of like maybe a, a typical, what a, what a robot looks like. We think it's very human-like. But it doesn't need to be human-like. It can be a, a tiny machine that can swim around your blood or, or, or clean up your house. Um, or you can even have a, a cyborg fish um, that helps uh, prevent uh, issues due to climate change and things like this. So that's my, my presentation. Thank you so much, Luke. That's fantastic. Um, so I will remind people that you can ask uh, questions in the Q&A box and also uh, to our panellists. It might be that there's a few comments in there that you want to sort of answer before we go into the Q&A session. And with that, uh, we hand over to Michael Gondry. 
Hi, um, so I'm not using slides, um, but I'll start talking about how I kind of got into my job, what I do, um, and then show you some examples of gear that I've got here. Um, I studied physics like most other people on this call, um, and I have to admit I'd originally intended to be a teacher, um, but I was doing some summer work before going travelling, um, and I started working for a company called Amec, um, and they were at the time a major construction company, and they had just bought a nuclear um, company, which is the bit that I now work for, and they were looking for people to go over and be graduates, so I kind of I got that opportunity. Um, I have to admit the fact that they offered me more money than the teaching course would had a lot to do with the decision. Um, so I kind of, I moved over here and I got very, very lucky in that I moved over at a time when technology was moving on. Um, robotics was just starting to come into things. Cameras were getting smaller. Computers were getting cheaper. Uh, and everything was just kind of, it was the perfect storm for moving on to new technologies and progressing things through. So the uh, an example of oh, what I'm doing is, you can see, got a crawler there. Um, those are used for going into, uh, as was mentioned, environments that are either too dangerous or too expensive to uh, send a person into. So nuclear industry uh, is the big one, but also done work for oil and gas, gas mains, things like that, going into explosive environments. Um, the kind of the physics side of it allowed me to, I, I'm as I'm not a straight mechanical engineer or electrical engineer, my physics background allows me to kind of work as a bridge and link those multiple um multiple fields together so the, the robotic side and the mechatronics is is ideal for a, a physicist really because you've got that knowledge of electronics and the knowledge of mechanical engineering and um, just not as in depth as some people um the kind of things that i do um so i would say about 40 percent of my time is robotics um about the other 40% is convincing people that they don't need to use robotics to do something and that there are simpler and cheaper ways of doing it. Um, but that itself requires a lot of knowledge on um, why you should and you shouldn't use um, various technologies in places. Um, things like the, the thing that's sat next to me, or if I just do that, the uh, bigger one that's packed <laughs> just behind me, um, we they well some of them are robots some of them aren't so like some are teleoperated which is what you see on robot wars so kind of just a person driving it giving it commands and moving around others are self-guided so they move through the environments conducting experiments taking measurements um removing samples that kind of thing um i don't know whether you can quite see it but if i do that just in the corner there, you can see a QR code on the back. So that's one of the big problems for robotics and nuclear is that the nuclear environments can kill the electronics. Um, so they can cause um, reactions that you're not expecting. Um, and the robot can do strange things. Um, the QR code is actually all about taking the robotics out of the robot, <laughs> which sounds backwards, but... Um, and we use kind of cameras and an external computer to plot the course and give commands to the robot. It's still autonomous, but it's outside of the dangerous environment. And it's just sending very simple signals through to that to uh, make it move around. Um, I have to admit, I absolutely love, <laughs> love my job. Um, it's new challenges all the time. Um, you, you know, sometimes it's a small camera system or a robot that's, you know, an inch across. Other times it's things like the one behind me that can pull a couple of tons and move around with a laser cutter on it. So that's me. <laughs>
Brilliant. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, I'm just going to I'm gonna go into the Q&A later, but there was one question of the robots that you showed. Have you made them? Uh, so the big one um, I made parts of. Um, it's part of a team working together. The smaller one, yes, um, done a lot of work on that. Um, it originally came, somebody else had built it and it came along, but we then, I then ended up rebuilding it for another job and it's a bit like the old broom. It's the same robot, but everything about it's different. <laughs> I know that one well. Yeah. Thank you so much. So next, we're going to move on to uh, Matthew Watkins. So Matthew, um, go ahead. Yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm an engineering technician at Imperial College London, uh, currently working in the physics department. Uh, I've been at Imperial for about five years now um, and I came here sort of straight after school uh, and did an apprenticeship. So at school, I was always very good with sort of the hands-on practical side of things, uh, whether this was the experiments in physics or manufacturing within engineering or DT, but I just sort of developed my love of all STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, maths, all of those subjects while at school. Um, so that's why even though I was off to place at Swansea Uni uh, to do a mechanical engineering degree, I decided to go to Imperial to do a four-year apprenticeship. Um, so yeah, my main role as an engineering technician is to support the research uh, that's done at the university, whether this is with the professors or the students. Um, but my role is to sort of design and manufacture scientific apparatus uh, which can help carry out this research, which is sort of at the cutting edge, which is what's so fascinating about, I think, I get to get involved with. Um, some of the projects I've been involved with have been prosthetic legs for ballet dancers, like Clara said, uh, been involved in an ion thruster. Uh, I worked with a group of students on a static hybrid rocket test rig, uh, which is just a system which would allow uh, the students to adjust multiple variables and see how the overall thrust would vary, uh, whether that's more oxidizer fuel or whatever variable they wanted to test. Um, I've also been fortunate enough to work with quite large organizations like the European Space Agency uh, and CERN with their Large Hadron Collider. Um, so a good example of a product I've worked on which links quite nicely to the robotics theme is a uh, deployable, deployable heat shield for a uh, Mars lander. Um, Hopefully, Toby will get some slides up. So um, this is basically an origami-based heat shield, which can compact down nicely into a small space. So whenever sending anything up to space, you've got to consider weight, uh, volume, because all of these things are massive costs. So a heat shield, which is quite a large system, it's incredibly useful to be able to compact down to a small space. So this is just a prototype sort of uh, feasibility, sort of checking the feasibility of this project. Um, but hopefully if Toby uh, goes through a few slides, we'll be able to see how it unfolds. So my role within the project, for the first physical prototype was only to design and manufacture some of the components within this, but it was also to implement the mechanical system. Um, so to open it out, we used uh, linear actuators. We also needed to know at what angle the system was at, so how much it was open. So this was done with uh, linear encoders, which would allow you to calculate just how big it was open to, because obviously the bigger it is, the slower it will go through um, a Martian atmosphere. Um, so yeah, I hope that sort of gives you an idea of projects I was involved with. Amazing, thank you, Matthew. Uh, that's really cool, I love that. And uh, I think, yeah, fully strikes a balance with things that we're hearing about at the moment. Um, before we go into the Q&A, so we have uh, Raquel next. So uh, Raquel, please. Yeah, sure. I think I just have two slides. Um, we're, I'm going to show you guys a little bit more about what the company that I work for does. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, so I work for a company called Vivacity. We're a small tech startup. Um, which uses a branch of um, AI called computer vision to basically um, detect and classify moving objects. And what we do with that data 
And things. So uh, we create sensors like the one that we can see here. And then if you go to the next slide, I'll kind of talk you through some of the data that we create with those sensors. Um, so what we do is classify um, objects. And we work basically with councils and transport authorities to help them better understand not only how road spaces and cities are being used, but then also how to make take that data and make better decisions about how to optimize these road spaces. Um, and then I think I mentioned in my bio as well that we're then taking this data and building another type of algorithm on top of that using a branch of machine learning called reinforcement learning in order to actually use this information to better control traffic lights. So if any of you kind of have had been running late for running late for school or you know been stuck in traffic, this is what we're hoping to solve. Um, or even just, you know, pressed a, um, been at a traffic light and you're the only pedestrian and you're just sitting there like you've got a, a red man and, you know, we all jaywalk. I know that that's something we all do. We're hoping to create safer ways to move people around the city much more effectively. So in terms of the data that we create, um, we basically create data like the one that we're showing. So uh, we can detect different types of um, road users, so different types of vehicles, pedestrian cyclists. We track them through the field of view so we know the types of movements that they're making, we can detect if, for example, if a pedestrian and a cyclist have had a, a, a collision or a near miss, so an almost collision to look at how we can improve safety for, for all road users. Um, and then most recently, actually, so the image on the top right is an analysis that we've started doing uh, almost to the day a year ago for, for local government. So we worked really closely for the, with the Department for Transport to provide data on social distancing. So were people actually adhering to the two meter rule, um, how did distancing actually change, especially in like um, city centers or on canals. And um, it was a really exciting year to be in this industry actually, because we were able to really be at the forefront of the decision-making around some of the, the restrictions and lockdown guidelines. Um, so what I do specifically, so I'm probably the furthest removed from, from the deep technical of, of uh, all the panelists today, I started um, working in research and development in geophysics. So I, I studied physics, but then went into oil and gas. Um, and then very quickly realized that while I really love the deep technical, um, I actually love working with different types of people. So really enjoyed working in multidisciplinary teams. Um, and my real passion ended up being actually translating science for kind of the, to the other parts of the business. So what I do in product is basically work really closely with our researchers and our developers and work really closely with our end users, our clients, so councils and local authorities to make sure that we are creating solutions that actually solve the real problems that they're facing. Um, so I work with basically everybody in the business, which is a really fun place to be. I basically talk for a living um, and uh, know everything that's going on and, ba and basically try and drive the strategy of the company based off of our technical understanding um, and technical abilities, but also really um, getting my ear to the ground to, to try and solve the, the, the transportation challenges of, of our cities. Um, yeah, I think from my perspective, uh, physics for me gave me the ability to really have those deep technical conversations with our research team, um, but also I was able to marry it with more of my, my soft skills and some of the um, the, I guess, business acumen that I gained from a business degree later um, to be able to sort of sit very nicely in, in the middle of, of my company. Amazing. Thank you. So uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, I see that the questions are basically popping off. We've got loads of questions going on, and I know that some have been uh, answered. I'm going to start with some uh, sort of general questions for um, everyone here. And actually, we've had a few questions about what sort of subjects people studied, what uh, degrees, what A-level subjects. Um, I know that uh, Luke's already been asked specifically about biology. Uh, interestingly enough, I think I started doing electrical engineering, and then I moved into material science and physics. And it sounds like everybody here went almost the opposite path. But uh, yeah, so what did you do? And do you have any ideas of what you'd need to do uh, to study in order to be able to do robotics or AI in universities? Should I, should I go first? 
Um, so yeah, it's a good question. I think um, it's easy to to worry too much about, you know, what should I study? I think take a step back and think, if I was to build a robot, what would I need to know? Um, and in general, we know that using mathematics, um, even though a lot of people find it hard, if you stick with it, it's very useful in science. Um, and also, uh, we know that ro robotics if, uh, at present are basically just computers. So knowing something about computers will be handy too. But I think the most important thing is to um, have imagination. Um, I know it sounds very general, but really you want you have some curiosity and just pick the subjects that you want to understand and that, that you like. Okay, I'm curious about English. I'm curious about history. I'm curious about biology. Um, so I took a mixture of things like English literature as well. So I think just follow your, your curiosity and it will take you somewhere. Yeah, I will echo that. I um for my I did my A levels in in the UK. You can hear my accent; it's not British. Um, but I had the choice between chemistry and uh, history. Um, and I decided that even though chemistry was more aligned with you know maths and physics, I really loved history. And I thought, you know what, I've got a good foundation in the sciences. Um, and I took French and history as well. So, but I I thought I didn't do didn't do very well. Um, but I enjoyed my time doing it. And so, it, you know, you can always pick up the technical skills later, um, even in terms of the degrees and framing your career. I, the people that I, I, my few physics degrees, but the people that I work with who are doing AI specifically, AI, like deep AI research, most of them have either engineering degrees. Um, one is actually a urban planning degree. Um, he's always been passionate about smart cities. And so he's taken that passion from an early age and translated it into deep AI research. So really it is about being passionate. You can pick up the, the very specific uh, subject matter uh, later down the line. Uh, so I'm going to agree with what everybody else has said. I actually think being interested in something is a lot more important than what you studied as such um, because you tend to learn more and deeper if you're interested in it and you look into it in your own time. Now, the one thing I would say is you probably want maths. <laughs> you know, all, all the others really are optional. I did um, maths, physics, chemistry and electronics um, but that in itself is a bit of a cheat because physics is applied maths and chemistry and electronics are applied physics. So what you will find at least at ear level, sorry, Luke, <laughs> at least at ear levels and that kind of level, what you learn in maths will help you with your physics. What you learn in your physics will help you with your chemistry and your electronics. You already know a lot of what you are learning so it allows you to pick up you know that little bit extra um as it gets deeper you know i will back off and say they are not just uh, they're not just one after the other but at, at kind of a level while you're just learning it and i know some of you probably aren't doing a levels you're doing level ones or twos or whatever it is um they you know they, they just build on each other so I would suggest, you know, pick two that support each other and pick one that you're just really interested in. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, you don't necessarily need to go to university. Please, teachers, don't shoot me. Um, we have a lot of people working here with me. We're probably about 50-50. Um, so people with degrees and PhDs and people that have taken the apprenticeship route. Um, a lot of it is really trying to figure out how you learn. You, you know, do you learn better from books or do you learn better from actually getting your hands on and doing it? The Yes, you will potentially start on more money if you do your um, degree, but you'll also start with a lot more debt. Um, you know, whereas people that start on an apprenticeship, it may take them... Sorry, <laughs> it may take them a little bit longer to get up to that value, but 
Um, my last boss had never done a degree. Um, he took the apprenticeship route and worked his way up. So that's me. Next. Um, yeah, I'd like to add on to what Matt said, really. I mean, physics is quite a nice subject with the amount of different routes you can enter into the field, really. And even by doing different subjects, so I'm coming in with more of an engineering background, I can bring a lot more uh, to the stuff we do here. I mean, I struggled a lot more with the exam side of things. I always found I was better with the practicals, whether, like I said, with the experiments in physics or chemistry or any of the sciences, I always found it far more enjoyable and far more entertaining actually getting my hands dirty and doing the physical thing rather than necessarily just reading out of a book. So that's why I went down the apprenticeship route because um, on my apprenticeship, it was four years long, but I still got to continue my studies going along, doing one day a week at college uh, where I continued learning. But I also got to learn so much on the job. It's so nice being able to see something in a textbook, go, oh, I understand that, and then go to work the next day and actually apply that. It's very rewarding seeing that side of things. Um, one other nice thing about doing apprenticeships is just because I've done this doesn't mean uni's not an option down the line. Uh, no doors are closed, so there's no sort of set out route which you have to take to end up within physics. Everyone can go sort of all manner of ways. You could do a degree and then go on to an apprenticeship. There's also multiple different entry levels, whether you want to go in after GCSEs, A-levels or after a degree. Uh, there's so many options out there. Yeah, and I definitely echo that. So everyone's got different experience. Like say I did uh, engineering as my first degree and then I ended up in material science. For those that are wondering, I didn't even study my A-levels. I actually dropped out of school and didn't uh, complete, which we could do when I was younger. Uh, I know that there's uh, the rules are slightly different now, but I didn't actually finish school. So there are different ways. Um, I will say that if there are certain degrees, if there's a specific degree, a specific place that you want to do, then there might be requirements. I know to do material science at Oxford, you have to have done uh, physics and chemistry, I believe. So um, you do have to do a little bit of sort of research on the course that you want to go on but as you've heard there are lots of different routes and uh certainly you can sort of make it your own um and i'm actually gonna sort of the next question sort of leads on from this is people are asking about are there sort of internships that they can do to learn more about robotics and ai or are there any programs and softwares that people should that people um at school can be learning and and looking at as a hobbyist are there any internships or programs or courses that you know of that you would recommend so not not an official internship but i know so i like to play around with um raspberry pis these are these uh, tiny computers and i know on their website they have a, a lot of free projects so you can you can get a raspberry pi for 30 pounds or bucks and uh, you, there's projects, for instance, you know, um, making like a, a four-legged thing that tries to walk or something. So, so there's, there's three things and they're pretty cheap. Um, so there's free material and the actual hardware is pretty cheap. So it's things like that. I um, very nearly did a, did a year in industry. Um, I would highly, I did a gap year anyways, but I just need to play it differently, but I did get a placement at um, an engineering firm for a year. Um, and I have friends who did similar things and, and really enjoyed it. And you get a better sense of the types of roles and the day to day as well. Um, you don't ever get a similar experience just by talking to us for an hour. So um, it's an, and I felt much more prepared after having taken a year before uni um, and yeah, so I highly recommend anything like that, your industry or gap years in, in placements um, to, to look into. Um, so uh, you'll probably find that a lot of companies are doing internships. Um, please don't send me a thousand requests, but I know we take on summer placement students and things like that, um, and most other groups will. Um, a good thing to potentially try do, I don't know how many of you know about LinkedIn, it's kind of like professionals Facebook, 
But if you, you know, set up a, an account on there and have a look through for groups that are discussing robotics or things that you're interested in, um, and just ask on there, uh, you, you know, whether companies have got summer placements going or things like that, because it, you will you will never find out. You know, there could be companies just around the corner doing robotics in a small shed somewhere, you know, five minutes from your house, and you'll probably never know about it. Um, uh, so really, you know, you want to be just asking around, seeing what's there. The other thing I would say is get involved in your local maker spaces and things like that. A lot of those will teach small programming and give you access to 3D printers and things like that. And they tend to have good connections with local industry as well. So they tend to know what um, summer placements are available, or at least who to talk to to try and get them. Um, yeah, I don't know much about internships, but I was quite lucky when I was at school. I did several work experiences and I found that very useful actually going to a company to see whether I even liked the subject and learning more about it. And while I was there, they'd be able to see what my interests were or sort of from those experiences, they were able to guide me far better into the sort of route, the career I wanted to end up in. Um. Yeah, no, absolutely. And there are, you know, that I know that around the country, there are lots of coding clubs and engineering clubs and things like that. There's all sorts of uh, clubs going on and universities will do maybe summer uh, school projects. And yeah, I, I know that um, when we were able to do this, of course, things are very different at the moment, but there are uh, summer, uh, there are um, school projects project placements in universities and things like that so there's lots of opportunities and lots of things out there um, and hopefully there's some in your area and actually talking about that uh, uh, Matthew Gondry you did sort of uh, mention okay. sort of something around the corner from you and uh, Ms uh, Danan asks um, we have a Jacobs around the corner from our school is that the same Jacobs now I don't know which school uh, Ms Jacobs uh, Ms uh, Danan's at uh, so I guess, where is your factory at? <laughs> uh, so the, the lab that I'm currently sat in is in Warrington. We do have robotics groups dotted all over the world. Um, for example, we've I'm not involved, unfortunately, but we've got people involved in robotics for NASA in America. And uh, I can't remember whether we still do, but we had people doing autonomous mining equipment and things like that in Australia. So, you know, that there is a, a real spread. It just depends because we've all got an awful lot of Jacob's offices, I'm afraid. I think it's about 700. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask uh, another sort of general question. There's, a, again, a few questions asking, uh, what are the best aspects of your job? What are the worst aspects? And, and what does your day job, what does your day look like? So uh, maybe everyone can sort of give us a, elevator pitch of the sort of what your day is like and what you like about it and what you maybe don't like about it. I'll go first. Oh. Okay. Oh, okay. You want to look? I was going to keep, keep with tradition. Go, go on then. The, the only tradition I keep to. Um, so as a, <laughs> as a theoretical physicist, um, I mainly um, uh, writing equations. Um, so actually maybe... Maybe I can, I don't know if you can see. So I work on a, a whiteboard. There's equations. Don't, don't worry too much about what it is. Um, so a, a lot of times I'm walking around thinking about something, and then I try and write an equation, um, or I do some, some coding. Um, and that's pretty much it. And also lots of walks in case I get stuck on something. It's good to, to walk. So uh, that's my day to day. And what I love about my job is that um, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about how, how the world works. Um, I have to ask good questions. Um, and I love the surprise. So if you run an experiment or if you do a calculation, um, you get an answer. Sometimes it's not something you expected. Um, and that's great because this means, oh, I, actually, I learned something new. Um, and the worst part of my job, I guess, at the moment, uh, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> 
<laughs> Nothing. Um, I actually really enjoy being physics. Um, yeah. Uh, so for me, um, I guess it, it's the thing that I enjoy the most and the thing that I hate the most are probably the same thing, which is I never really know what I'm going to be doing from day to day. Um, because we're kind of a, a consultancy company, um, what I'm doing, I, our job is to solve people's problems. I've got this stuck. We need to fix that, you know, those kind of things. Um and so the the work is highly dependent on what people want from us. Um, so that, you know, our kind of approach is to what's on the market that we can buy. So can we just buy something that some other companies built and use that to fix it? Can we buy something and modify it? Or like the things I've got around me, can we build something from scratch? Um so the, the day is very varied, you know, and a, a lot of it is actually talking to customers, figuring out what their problem is, um, and then going away and trying to kind of think of what I've seen or what scientific papers I've read or things like that that could help solve that problem, and then getting together with a team of people and trying to fix it. I, I would say, you know, it, it's maybe 20% developing something completely new um, uh, and the rest of it is just kind of learning how to implement things in different ways. Hope that helps. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so my role is usually working with people like Luke, sort of who would have all the theoretical theory things and actually putting it into practice. Um, and that's one thing I really enjoy actually being able to see a physical thing being developed with a whole group of people and working with a whole range of people from physicists, students, electrical engineers, it just everyone gets involved with projects to bring everything together and get something that actually works. Um, I didn't work on this as much as I wish I did, but many of you may have seen the recent Mars lander, the um, rover Perseverance. Now, the amount of engineering science, that's taken years of research and development, building on sort of mission after mission uh, to develop what they have now. I mean, half of uh, Mars landings have ended up failing, um, crashing down, which is why sort of as important as the theoretical stuff is, so is the practical side of things to get a something that works. You can do all the testing you like to make sure you get it right on Earth so that when it's actually applied, uh, it works when it needs to. Uh, yeah, mine is very different. My day-to-day -day is genuinely changes so dramatically from one day to the next. Um, at the moment, I am drafting two um, bids for for like proposals for potential clients, for new trials for our traffic control algorithm. Um, I also generally basically am constantly either speaking to customers uh, bringing their challenges to our development, research and development teams and brainstorming ways that we can actually solve their problems. Um, I do our product strategy. So then I basically take that away and say, okay, cool. Um, what is the commercial opportunity here? How well can we actually address this problem? And then I work with our founders um, and our research teams to actually solve that for them. Um, and then... Yeah, what else did I, mine is a huge variety of things. I do a lot of negotiation because I, I work more on the business side as well. Um, but also a lot of data science. So I help clients with the data that we provide them to draw insights and say, cool, look at this new cycle in that you put in. Isn't it interesting that it's only, you know, it's only being used at night and not during the day. Why could that be? And so there's a lot of problem solving to, to what I do. Um, but it's very much, I'm very much on the people side. And actually with that, uh, Raquel, so there was a question in the chat that was asking, uh, do you think that, you know, your job will be able to help reduce the carbon footprint in cities and things like that? And maybe you'd just like to talk about that a little bit more. Little yeah, bit more. of course it is. Absolutely. Um, our, our mission is to help build a more sustainable future for our planet. So every, especially on the traffic signal control side, I'm sure you can imagine that 
by promoting uh, pedestrians and cyclists and saying, you know, reducing the waiting time will help our, our what we're trying to do is create a, a shift in modes for people to actually be incentivized to travel by foot or by cyclist, whereas um, maybe it's, you know, we'll take you a little longer by car because we want, want people to, to use these active modes. Or um, alternatively as well, if we reduce the amount of traffic, you um, reduce the amount of time that cars are sitting idle at a traffic light, that's just cars that are, that's just your mission, uh, you're adding emissions to our uh, problem. So by optimizing travel um, and also promoting active forms of travel at the same time, uh, we're hoping to try and do our part to tackle the climate emergency. Excellent. Um, and, and this one was sort of, uh, this question was asked aimed at Luke and uh, Matthew G. Um, although if anyone else wants to import, of course, but what do you think are the challenges facing the robotics industry now? And what potential challenges do you think will arise in the future? And of course, we're all worried about the robotic uprising of uh, <laughs> you know, 2025. <laughs> Well, Matthew, you, you go ahead with this one first. I'll think about Um So a, a lot of it is actually, well, it depends which way you want to take the problems from, but part of it is kind of having the number of skilled people necessary to maintain the, robot, the robotic side of things. Um, you know, the, we need more programmers. We need more electronics engineers, that kind of thing. Um, but at the flip side of that is the reason we need that is because you're potentially using some of those robots to um, take jobs, you know, and <laughs> that's an awful thing to say, but take jobs from people whose skill set is more um, trade and craft based. Um, so there's kind of, I think one of the major things is the the ethics and the the kind of, the, the process of how we go for that switch, how we bring more robot robotic systems into work and businesses and things like that, while not displacing people from their jobs and also upskilling people so they can maintain and use those systems. Because at the moment, if you would switch every job to a robot doing it, the economy would grind to a stop because a lots of people would be out of work and b there'd be nobody to actually keep the robots running. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, thanks, Matthew. Yeah, that raises some, <laughs> some good challenges. I'll go from a different approach. I'll say um, about kind of more of a scientific challenge. Um, so just, just some perspective is that, so this is why looking at biology is interesting and useful because um, through millions of years of, of evolution, um, biological systems, so like a cat, us, you know, a worm, can do these crazy complex tasks. So for instance, me just, you know, go, going towards a screen like this and talking at the same time, um, it, it, it seems to us so, such an easy thing to do, but getting a machine to do it is very hard. Um, so that's why we take inspiration from, from biology. So if we understand how say the human brain works, which we're very, very far from doing, um, we will be able to, to, to understand how we can build good robotics and AI. So there's that challenge. But I also think there's another challenge um, that we need to consider now in the modern world is, is, is our thing sustainable? So, so Matthew touched upon it in terms of the economic and the, in terms of society, but also, you know, um, are these robots going to be good for, for the climate? Are they going to help us um, with climate change, climate breakdown? Um, so you as young people have to, you have two problems. You have the science problem, which we need imagination. We need people who, who want to question and say, yes, I'll, I'll build whatever and try it. And also the people who, who also like, like Raquel, who are actually looking at implementing it. And also like Matthew Watkins and, everyone uh, building things and actually implementing in society. Uh, we need people on every corner doing a good job so that uh, robotics is actually used very well. Maybe. <laughs> um, 
we we actually had a question for uh, Matthew Watkins. So you sort of mentioned deciding whether to go the apprentice route or university route. And the question is, do you have any regret um, going for the apprentice, the apprenticeship route? And I guess also, you know, uh, is there actually anything that you say, actually, this was better for me? You know, what were the benefits for you personally for going for an apprenticeship? Uh, I've got no regrets at all. It's probably one of the best decisions I made for myself. I mean, apprenticeships aren't going to be uh, perfect for everyone. Some people, like, for example, my brother was very academic, uh, high-flying, getting straight A's, so university was the way for him. But for me, although I wasn't terrible with the academic side, my skill sets were far more about practical application and sort of problem-solving, and I didn't feel I was going to be able to get that while at uni. Um this opportunity of the apprenticeship came up uh, and it was just so perfect for what my interests were and everything like that. Um, so if I sort of give you an example, what my apprenticeship was like first year was full time at college. So I was still continuing my studies. I think I got a BTEC level three in that. So um, I did that for a year. And then the three years after I was on site learning on the job because uh, it's a university, I got to visit six different departments from mechanical engineering, material science, um, physics, aeronautical engineering. And I got a real taste of just how many different sort of interesting projects there are out there. Um, and that's how I ended up in physics where I am now and found that physics is just the most interesting one to me. Uh, the fact you can actually apply things and see things being implemented five, 10 years down the line. So no, I've not got a single regret about not going to university because the door's still open. That's the other thing. If I did want to go down that route, I can still go if I want to. Amazing. I'm so glad to hear that. And it just shows that there are all different paths there are all different routes. And uh, even when we were talking about subjects before, you know, it might not be a linear path. Other opportunities might come in. Like I say, I started doing electrical engineering and then the opportunity came up to work for a company uh, as a material engineer and then I got into material science so that flexibility is is brilliant and like you say Matthew you, you can still do a degree if you want to down the line but I'm so happy to hear that you uh you really enjoyed the the uh the apprenticeship that's awesome um I'm gonna touch on something that sort of uh so the question came up um, and we might not want to answer this, but uh, the question was asked, Raquel, whether you face any, um, you know, sort of sexism or um, adverse uh, behavior in science. And I know that uh, Luke also works with uh, a group that I'm a member of, Tigers. So uh, maybe uh, Luke would sort of like to touch on on this as well. Maybe not the sexism side, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, very, very awesome. Happy International Women's Month. Um, yeah, unfortunately I have um, in various degrees. So from small microaggressions um, on quite a regular basis to a couple of times where it's been quite blatant and in your face. Um, it's an, yeah something that the world is changing. It's not changing as fast as many of us would like. Um, I would like to say that, you know, even though, so my, my degree... Um, was the lowest female to male ratio um, in, in, in my year. Um, but it was never at university. Um, it actually ended up coming in later and it, it I think had ended up having to we had more with cultural differences that that led to some of these comments. Um, I'm happy to say it's becoming less and less. I, I also I chose to leave a very large uh, corporate company for partly for these reasons, but I really wanted a cultural shift. So I worked for a small startup or 50 people. I know everybody on a personal level and it has never happened um, in the past couple of years that I've been there. So um, I think that companies that promote diversity and inclusion are seeing that they are able to attract and retain talent because they have a zero. Um, they don't have a policy, but this is just not something they will um, tolerate. Um, but yeah. So oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I, I I was waiting. Um, yeah, just to echo what Raquel Re was saying is that, um, in general, we need we need more women. We need 
more people who are different. Um, and why is that? Because um, having a diverse, uh, having a, a team full of different people, different perspectives, coming from different places, um, different experiences um, is useful because, well, one, it's fun. And two, you actually do science better. Like this is actually, it's scientifically known that science is better with a diverse workforce. Um, and so if anyone is struggling to, to, to think of um, women in physics and, and sciences, there's lots. Um, so there's a lot of websites I, I might be able to, to put them in the chat. Um, there's so many great women um, uh, scientists that our world would not be the same without. So um, women, we, you know, we should give women more uh, roles of leadership to lead projects. Um, and yeah, because they're, they're, they're just as good, if not better. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, so there are amazing role models out there. Uh, I mean, I, the question also tagged me in as well. I know that uh, as a trans person, I have experienced some discrimination, but what I would say is that that's less these days and that the world is a better place. And there are people like the people on this call who are working to sort of prove that. Strangely enough, I've had more uh, discrimination from my tattoos than the fact that I'm trans because I am absolutely covered in tattoos. Uh, and I will say you should wait until you're older before you get them. So we're almost running out of time. So I'm going to ask uh, a very quick pop round of what is your favorite uh, achievement so far um, in your work career? So this might be a big question, but I'm looking for a short answer. <laughs> Using simple physics to understand biology. I'm going to go with an experiment I did that used 200 gym balls to, uh, <laughs> to, to test something with swarm robotics and uh, lowering of equipment. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go with when I built a static rocket test rig because it was literally rocket <laughs> science. Nice. <laughs> um, you guys have heard mine. Mine is, I think we're the we're leading the uh, um, charge on AI for traffic signal control. So we're the, we're, the, we're the first people that have implemented it in the real world in this country. And I actually have a patent on spinal implants. So if you have problems with your spine, there is a, a patent out there and you might have, if you need your back fixing, it might be one of mine. Uh, I don't get that much money from that. Um, and I one final thing uh, as a, a quick pop quiz. Um, do you have any role models and heroes in science and STEM? Um, so it's, just, it's strange because none of my family did science. Um, so I had to like, uh, re so I read a lot of biographies of scientists, which really inspired me. So a lot of different scientists, but one in particular, but it might be a bit boring, but um, for me, Albert Einstein um, just was, was, a, was a key kind of learning about his life and how he approached science. Um, of course, no one's perfect, but um i just liked his his you know his his way of looking at the world uh for me it was um john glenn so john glenn being the oldest astronaut in space so i remember uh watching that last launch live um that's really what inspired me to want to be an astronaut and and go into physics funnily enough oh so Matthew, <laughs> I, I, I don't know whether it's anybody specific, but it was watching kind of the, the shuttle launches and things like that and just realizing, you, you know, the, the people on that shuttle, they, they, weren't, um, they weren't really pilots or that, that kind of thing. They were all scientists, you know, multiple degrees, PhDs, that that kind of thing and just the, the level of you know knowledge they'd put into doing something that exciting and that interesting. And Matthew? 
Um, yeah, not really a person, but a project. While I was at school, the Bloodhound uh, SSC was being developed, uh, SLR or whatever it is now, but that was a product I found so fascinating learning about. So that's what inspired me and got me into STEM and everything like that. Um, a couple of my heroes, uh, Sally Ride, the youngest astronaut in space, uh, and, and also uh, uh, Jocelyn Bell Brunel, who is an amazing physicist and astrophysicist. And with that, we come to an end. So I'd like to thank our speakers. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, to our students, uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, again, I'd like to thank Luke, Matthew, uh, Raquel and Matthew for the fantastic presentations. I hope everyone found it interesting. Students, before you go, there is a QR uh, code up on screen. If you can uh, do that feedback, if you can scan it and do the feedback survey, that would be fantastic. Uh, it's just a very short survey, so it won't take too much. Also, uh, a final note, thank you for uh, the teachers. Thank you for supporting the Limitless Careers Week. Uh, and the IOP will be in touch shortly with links to other great career resources from the IOP and recordings of this week's online event. So with that, thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>